ask you this. Were you playing guitar with Mark from time to time? Oh, yeah. We would hang out in, in the apartment. So you guys played together casually. Yeah, and he would come and sit in with my band. We were just two dudes like you and I. He knew you were the guitar player other than just being a guitar salesman. Yes. Call. He wants you to come to Montserrat and finish the album. And then you had a college offer. David Bowie was bye-bye. And so what did you do? I mean, how did you get through all that? The first thing I said to Mark when he told me that was like, it's Christmas time. I can't leave Rudy's during the holiday season. <laughs> That sounds like the Like a Rock album with Peter when I was getting ready to do a club gig that I'd been rehearsing for a couple of weeks. And I got called to be him with Rick Vito to play in Like a Rock album. <laughs> you play the club tonight. I can't come, you know. Right, exactly. It was like, go ahead. I was and, there. I know. Go ahead. And, and he laughed and he said, I've already talked to Rudy. And I'm like, <laughs> what? And he said, I oh, talked to Rudy. Because he and Rudy and I, you know, we were buddies. We hung out a lot. You know? He was like playing the chessboard. He was yes, playing. exactly. So that was December. He said, we're taking a break anyhow over the holidays, and then we'll start in January. I'm like, great. So I worked through the holidays, January 1st, 1985. All of 81 to 85 was really me playing gigs around town with the leisure class. So you so, got friends for four years. We were just hanging out, yeah. They finished making movies. The record company sent Rudy and I a copy of it because it said thanks to Rudy's music or whatever okay. on it. I took it home. All right. I put it on and I play the first track and I'm listening to it and I'm like, this sounds like a fucking Bruce Springsteen record to me and took it off. <laughs> Never listened to the rest of it. <laughs> oh. Dude, I was not a fan. Here's the crazy part about this. I went to see them their first gig. Their first gig in New York when it was the four piece, right? Yeah. At the bottom line, I went to see them. I fell asleep during the gig while they were playing. I was with my buddy, John, who is bass player my band. I'm nodding out and John elbows me at one point. He goes, they're going to play Sultans of Swing. Maybe you want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I told Mark that story. It was like, dude, I don't know what you, you guys are like the most fucking boring band I've ever seen. So this is really a great lesson. For the young musicians out there. Yes. So not get caught up in your head with preconceived notions about your taste, interfering with the business part of what you're trying to create. In well, there's that. that. Yeah. Your skill sets that you're offering to the world as a player. You have to divorce yourself. You're not Neil Young quite yet. Yeah, exactly. People, fuck no, I'm not getting involved. You can't do that. You've got to be open-minded. I mean, to me, the Joker was an abomination. I stopped listening to Steve Miller records when he came out with that woo woo with a cat. Right, call. right, right, right. Where's the revolution? You know, come on. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, Jungle Love, are you kidding me? And then that's no disrespect to Greg, who I just interviewed a couple hours ago and we learned all the parts. But that song, <laughs> The Joker, are the two biggest songs we play on stage. That's what the crowd goes nuts and loses. I know, man. So what do I know? What the hell do I know? Dude, you know, I got to say, I listened to Jungle Love. I popped it up during my 80s revisitation, the 70s and 80s night. And I'm listening to the lyrics and I'm thinking, whoa. I don't know if that would pass today. I wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. Yeah. Stop <laughs> saying no. That's one of the rules of improvisation. When you do improvisation and somebody hands you a line, you never like say no. You just accept it and take it. I started out wanting to be in the Rolling Stones or Jimmy Henry. You know what I mean? It was like, it was all about being in a band. That's I all I thought about. You have no idea where it's going to go. You think you got a plan. You got to like, vision and yes dreams are important and an end goal is important but man stuff comes across the windshield yeah like out of nowhere yeah those great big giant bugs flying by me just go Bleh! <laughs> i did not ever honest to god kenny that conversation about me playing in dio straits never happened i didn't want to play in that band I had asked Mark maybe to write some tunes with me and produce some demos and help me get a deal. But that was not what I wanted to do. So not to be, you know, too cold blooded here and be too yeah. capitalist, but when he told you how much he was going to pay you, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> like, were you embarrassed or were you shocked? Were you surprised? I was shocked. 
Okay. And then the next thing you know, you're at Wembley. You're I'm get- in the band. I'm on an airplane in first class for the first time in my life on New Year's Day, 1985. It's Mark and me and Neil Dorfman. And in the seat next to Neil, in first class, strapped in, are the digital master tapes. I'm like, oh my God, I used to read about the Allman Brothers, like buying their playing seats for their guitars. <laughs> we get to Montserrat. My mind is blown, man. I'm hanging out on, on an island at Air Studios and it's beautiful. And the studio is amazing. And there's a chef and there's like police and staying and all these people have produced there. And I'm hanging out in the studio one morning and I look up and there's this elderly gent with like white hair leaning over the board in the sound room and he sticks his hand over and he said hi i'm george martin oh yeah there you go i hear you're the american welcome i hope you have a good time Uh, and i'm like i was speechless man and you know me i'm never speechless you know george martin you know (laughs) it's like and he was so kind and he like split and then you know like the next day studio manager comes and goes are you guys okay if Neil Young comes in? Oh. He wants to check out the yeah. Sony, the Sony digital thing. <laughs> and suddenly Neil Young is like, dude, I was working in a guitar shop like hey, 70, I, 72 dude, hours before. Long ago, I was doing a guitar center with you. <laughs> I know the whole thing. Go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, at one point I believed that I was the patron saint of retail guitar, guitar <laughs> retail salesman. That I was the guy who lived the fantasy. So, you know, and there's just like so many stories as you have after that. How soon after doing that record did you get into doing Wembley? What year was that? I I forget. Okay, so 1985, we finished the album three months. The album came out in like April of 85. We started touring and we're all over Europe. We went to Tel Aviv. We played Jerusalem, Yugoslavia, as it was called then. And one day on the tour bus, And the tour manager says, hey, we have a bunch of dates at Wembley Arena. Two weeks of gigs sold out. And Wembley Arena is across the parking lot from Wembley Stadium. Now, the arena is like, you know, Staples Center or, you know, that kind of thing. The stadium is 72,000 people, right? And he gets on and he says, "Uh, Bob Geldof and a couple of other guys are putting this charity event together the band's gonna play it's a 20 minute thing and we're gonna play this charity event that's all we knew that's all i knew about live aid that's uh, i didn't know other bands because this is the day before cell phones before computers and you're traveling europe and you're lucky if you'd find german mtv right? right and so had no clue until we got back to london that july and we're playing nights over at Wembley. Pete Townsend comes to play for a Prince Charles ball. I meet Lady Di and play this. Crown, man. You watch the Crown series. They show that. <laughs> it's nuts. And then we literally walk across the parking lot. That's unbelievable. <laughs> and go hang out. Unbelievable. In the morning. And it's like all of the bands who are playing Live Aid are lined up in the order that they're going to play. Right to meet Charles and Diana again. So like status quo, Spandau Ballet, comes down to straights, comes around the corner. I'm the last guy in line in straights. To my left is Brian May of Queen, right? And it's like Brian and Roger and- John Deacon, thank you. There you go. Okay. On the other side of them is David Bowie, his secretary Coco, who I had met, Elton John. No. Dude, and and so like <laughs> Charles and Diana are coming down, are coming down the line and they're being introduced in the protocol officer and all that shit. I had met them like four days before. So I'm like totally uninterested. I'm standing beside fucking Brian May, right? And like at the time when I had hair, I had like big hair. I took the first Queen album into the hair. <laughs> dresser's place and pointed to Brian May's hair and said, cut my hair like this. And I'm telling him that story while we're in line. <laughs> I'm going, dude, yeah, it's like, 
I know this may sound ridiculous. I mean, the guy's a biophysicist, astrophysicist or some shit, right? Charles and Diana come down the line and the photos are like the back of my head because I'm talking to Brian May. And yeah, so, you know, backstage, they had a Hard Rock Cafe set up and with all the monitors so you could watch the show right. from back there. And if, if you've seen the Queen movie, which I'm sure you have, yeah. they did a great job of setting up what that looked like. There were little camp trailers. There were, you know, patio furniture. And I'm wandering around and it's like, oh, Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. I don't know. It's like everybody you've ever idolized, dreamt about, uh, yeah. fantasized. Yeah, I mean, it's just like the absolute dream world. Dude, it, it was seriously like that experience for me. And I've likened it to this before. It was like an alien abduction, or it was very similar to The Wizard of Oz. I got like lifted out of, of this world, plopped down into another world. And a year and a half later, I got dropped back down into Kansas. And it was like, you know, I had this dream and you were there and you were there and you were there. You guys are doing the set. Now you've gotten over all that craziness. You know, you had to grab your guitar. You had to go up there and you had to, yeah, yeah. You had to bring it. So apparently you brought it because I'm watching the videos. You look like you're bringing it. Dude, I'm standing backstage and Sting's going to come up and do money for nothing with us, right? Right. And the band is all lined up to go out on stage. And the way it was set up was like you had 20 minutes and there were lights set up that were green, yellow, and red. So when green was happening, you were being broadcast. When yellow was happening, you had five minutes left. And if it went to red, you were cut off. And I'm standing backstage, things standing to my right. And it's like the first look that I get at the stadium, you know, outside. And it's just people. And we had played some big gigs, man, soccer stadiums before and all that stuff. But I'm looking out there and there's just like a sea of people right? And thinking about all the television broadcast and all that. But you know, Kenny, I have never had stage fright. I get anxious, but I'm more excited. Let's just go fucking play, man. I don't want to wait any longer. And it's just the way it is for me. Sting is standing next to me. Now he had done a set earlier with Branford, the two of them, the duet, right? They did Roxanne and a couple of others. And he, he leans over to me and goes, man, so many people. Now, he's already done it, this thing. And he says to me, man, are you scared? Because I'm really nervous. <laughs> I look at him and I look out at the crowd and I go, Sting, I've waited my entire life for this. I am so ready to play. Let's go. And that was it. Wow. So you were transformed. Yeah, brother. You were transformed and you became a molecularly, genetically altered creature, not f full of fear. And you love the sacred church that we live inside. Yes. And you do an altar call and you just go, take me. Take That's me. it. Quick flashback to New York City. I'm playing in clubs when I first get there. I'm playing a gig with a singer-songwriter. And Elliot comes to the gig to see me. Here's my mentor. Here's the cat that turned me on to all this stuff. We play the first set. Then I come over and I sit down at the table with him. And it's a small club. It's like not tracks. I mean, it was literally like, you know, Cafe Cordiel size. And first question he asked me is, is like, are you having a good time? I'm like, yeah. I'm having a, yeah. I'm playing guitar, man, in the band. Yeah, I'm having a good time. He goes, sure doesn't look like it. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, you, you know, you're just kind of looking at your guitar. And I was like, huh. He was going to sit in the next set. And he said, just watch. He got up and he played in that tiny little cafe like he was playing in front of 30,000 people. Smiling, moving around, looking at people, grabbing somebody's beer bottle and playing slide and just joyous at play, right? We get done, and I got to follow that shit. <laughs> but I get done, and he sits down at the table, and he said, you know what, man? 
when people go to work on Monday morning, they may not remember the band or who was playing, but they'll remember me. He said, these people want to see someone having fun doing something that they can't do. That's right. That's part of what we are obligated with the gifts that we have. We have to. I agree. Yes. It's not of our own. We're not really in control of it. We're just the delivery system. I agree with that, man. And, you know, it's like spreading the joy, like this gig that I did the other night, man. I was so happy to be back out playing with my friends who are great musicians and playing in this community that has accepted me as one of their own in Mississippi, brother. You know? How could I not have a great time? How could I not be joyful? I'm raising a righteous noise, man. It is church. And getting healed. People get healed at these gigs. I mean, you know, they come up to you and they go, ah, you know, you touched me. You know, I mean, I remember people come up to me when I used to play at church and I'd like, come yeah. up and the night before I'm all hung. Maybe I did a couple of lines, you know, I'm all like, <laughs> you know, the, you know, the, the five o'clock shadow. I'm like, right. I really, you really liked it, huh? And it goes like, you changed my life. Now I can go on with my life. Thank you for what you played on the yeah. But you got to put all that aside. You got to go, you know what? He's probably right. He probably had this incredible experience. And I just was the delivery system. But you can't judge. You have to get out of the way and let go and let God. Because well, it really yeah. is a part of that, you know. Uh, yeah, like over the years, absorbing what was taught to me, besides that lesson that Elliot gave me, my teachers at school, when I would be bitching at them about learning technique or learning scales and all that kind of stuff, they're like, look, you're learning it to become so internalized that it's just coming through you. You've opened that channel and the distance between here and here and, and here is unblocked. When you donate a pint of blood, you don't know where it's going. Right. Beautiful. Listen, is there anything else you want to tell the young viewers out there or old viewers that you'd like to give them before you take off? Because we're way into this, man. I, mean, uh, no, man, I, 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 I know, man. I know. Well, as, as, as you know, I'm not a short story writer. No, no. <laughs> yeah. One of the most important lessons that I've learned in life, you can apply it to your art, has changed my life in a major way when I've tried to embrace this philosophy for a long time. This is the only moment you have. Tomorrow never knows. Tomorrow doesn't care for your plans, for your dreams, for anything. And we are taught this lesson over and over again when we lose someone in our lives, if they walk out and don't come back again. Live each moment like it's your last. Enjoy it, celebrate it, and play, play those gigs like it's the last one you're gonna leave people with nice <laughs> ladies and gentlemen jack sonny thank you so much brother you're beautiful man oh man <laughs> kenny who loves you baby <laughs> <laughs> remember i bought the boot i'm gonna i gotta get a boot man <laughs> i'll send you one if i see one all right Right. Love you, man. You want to tell people about your radio show real quick? Yeah, real quick. I mean, I, I've got a radio station, 24-7 broadcast, commercial-free, Jacksonny Guitar Radio. And I do a live thing most nights, 7 o'clock till 9 o'clock, um, spinning influences and inspirations. And I have friends like Kenny and Pete Anderson and, you know, Reeves Gabrels, a bunch of my guys, Eddie Martinez, doing a similar thing. We'll talk just like we did, but we'll talk more about the songs and the artists that influenced them and inspire them. You know, it's kind of a guitar-centric radio station. It's great, man. I've done the show. You guys got to tune in. It's fantastic. I appreciate it. Jacksonny.com, iHeartRadio. It's just amazing. You just never know what's going to walk through the door, you know, especially if you're working in a music store. Opportunities walk in all the time. You know, you just have to be there. You have to be prepared. Of course, you have to be practicing your instrument and know what you're doing and have your voice in shape and look good and have some clothes. You know, so when you go to the audition, you look fresh and you look like you're on your game and you got to bring it every time. So thanks a lot, Jack. That was great. And of course, Jack and I were buddies also in the manufacturing business, We, as we discussed. Jack, thanks a lot, brother, for joining us for this interview. We didn't get you to play guitar, but we'll have you back another time. You can show us some of your recipes because he's also an incredible chef. If you'd like to take lessons from me, you can go to my Fret Friends subscription website 
which is F-R-E-T-F-R-E-N-Z.com. You can see a sample lesson. There's also a 24-hour trial if you'd like to see what it's like. If you like this YouTube video, please like it and also click on subscribe. For now, thanks for tuning in to Fret Friends Play and Tell. This series will be going on throughout the summer until I start going back to work again with the Steve Miller Band. So until then, we'll see you on the next one. But thanks a lot. The next one's going to be Pete Anderson, producer, guitarist extraordinaire with Dwight Yoakam. All right, well, thank you. We'll see you on the next one. And stay tuned always. Mm -hmm.